So what we can see in our core team for the smart city development in Berlin, but also being in exchange with international experts is a kind of paradigm shift within the smart city community. It has been a very techno-centered point of view where technology was actually driving developments, also businesses, big corporations were the kind of backbone of smart cities. But what we've seen in the last couple of years is actually a kind of more people-centered point of view. And the people-centered point of view hasn't been enough for understanding how smart cities can actually contribute to something that is important. So what we're seeing right now and also what we're doing in Berlin is driving towards a more commons oriented approach where we actually take planetary boundaries, but also new economic concepts like donut economy or creative commons into account. Of course, we're super interested of um, what a kind of governance should look like in these kind of transforming and evolving smart city paradigms. And that's why we invited and set up this track here. And before we actually dive into bold ideas and interesting concepts, my colleague Özlem Demitepe looked into the governance definition. And we wanted to start off by understanding a little bit what is governance in this context. Özlem, over to you. Thank you, Karin. Governance can be basically understood as the activities performed by the government, but nowadays uh, the term is being used in a different meaning. And the current meaning refers to a model uh, and actions of creating the necessary structures to host collaboration among all actors uh, opposite to the sovereign authority. And I put here uh, one of the definitions from UNESCO. Uh, they say governance is about culture and institutional environment in which citizen, citizens and stakeholders interact among themselves and participate in public affairs. And uh, governance also comes into question in the debate concerning, concerning the transition from government to governance. And scholars explain the transition as an effort uh, to find an effective way of organ organizing decision-making. And uh, this decision-making is a replacer of the old liberal democracy model where elected Democrats act as a middleman to decide what is good for people and the planet. And uh, also governance brings about its conceptualized models, components, indicators to the stage to discuss its fulfillment conditions. And I put here some components of good governance, as you may see, responsiveness, rule of law, uh, participation, equity, and so on. And there are other uh, types of governance uh, that are being mentioned in the last couple of decades. They are co-governance, meta-governance, creative governance, and generative governance, and humble governance, and so on. So my title today is Dancing and Jamming in the Smart City. Uh, I actually mean it both uh, literally uh, as well as conceptually, but we'll get to that towards the end. Uh, what I'd like to do first, you know, I, in my, my, I've been involved with urban innovations in the last 20 years and something that I have realized in my encounters in, in, in many, many countries and many cities is that we don't really have a common language. And when we talk about transformation, transition, uh, transformative action, we have you know, a fuzzy understanding what, what, of what it is. And I think that's extremely important before we start a discussion. So, uh, and we have two inputs today. So in my part, I'll try to uh, uh, put, take those concepts and, and um, look at them so that we have a stage where we have a more or less common understanding because I'm sure we'll never have a fully common understanding. And Alois to take over and go a bit deeper into the technology part. So this is the idea. And after Alois, I would show a few examples from from my library of cases that I've been collecting around the world. I look into three cities, which is uh, Medellin, uh, uh, Calgary in Canada, and uh, Taiwan. So that would just to inspire you into the workshop. But uh, let me start with my presentation here. 
So I have three questions which I'll try to answer in 10 minutes, which is uh, what is the origin of the practices of transformative action? Why do we need transformative approaches in governance? Uh, what is transformative governance in the context of the smart city? And that we will take into the workshop. So uh, the first question, what is the origin of the practices of transformative action? And I would like to go back uh, <laughs> 2,500 years uh, to the Greeks, uh, which <laughs> in the, at the shores of the Mediterranean, the world saw the dawn of modern scientific thinking. And it took about 2000 years to, for the scientific revolution to unfold. Uh, this was around between the 15th and, and the 18th century. And shortly after we had the industrial revolution uh, and hundred years later, we have the marketization of society which was called the great transformation by the economic historian Karl Polanyi. And this is an extremely important moment to understand in human history. Uh, because if, even though we know it intuitively, we, 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 we keep forgetting it. So marketization of society and, and 100 years later, we have the digital revolution, the smart city, and simultaneously the climate crisis. But let's go into very shortly one slide on what was the great transformation or what Karl Polanyi meant by the great transformation. Uh, this is the book which he had written. It came out in 1944, and this is where Polanyi describes the tra transformation from the agrari agrarian society to the industrial society. But what is more, more remarkable and most uh, uh, important to understand is that it's the, the market that he's talking about is not a market that we see like on the streets on, on, on our, on our, in our cities. It's a completely different kind of market. It's a market which is self-regulating. And I have one slide which shows this remarkable transformation. Okay, this is, the agrarian society on the left side, this remained more or less for 12,000 years, where the economic sphere and the technological spheres were subsystems of the much bigger social order, which, uh, constitute, which is constituted of the religious, ecological, and political. And this, and during the great transformation, uh, the techno-economic sphere became the all-encompassing sphere, including the political, the social, religion, ecology. So all of that became small subsystems of the techno-economic sphere. And this sub, and, and the techno-economic sphere is not something, it, it's a self-regulating system with its own institutions, and it can, it's completely dissociated, let's say, from our planet. So whatever is happening in the techno-economic sphere does not really care about the planet. This is something extremely important to understand uh, when we are dealing with um, ideas of transformation. So uh, keeping that on mind, uh, uh, let's see what happened uh, with the marketization of society. So this was in the, uh, at the turn of the century, this is where it all began. And the factors of production was land, labor, technology, and capital. And it went extremely well. I mean, the amount of wealth that the world had, had, had built up is unprecedented and uh, very successful. However, there were lots of failures. I mean, if we, if we had lived at the turn of the century, we'd have seen the incredible squalor in our cities. I mean, it looked like, I mean, the slums that London had or, 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 or all other, basically all other Western countries was comparable to those slums that we have in, in, the, in the global South. So, the, so Polanyi calls this the first wave, which was the marketization. And the second wave was actually the response to the failures of marketization of society. And the second wave was um, mostly triggered by the New Deal with uh, President Roosevelt in the 1930s. And, um, and after that followed, and after the Second World War, followed the modern Western welfare state. This was nothing but a response to the failures of the marketized society. Uh, and later on, we have the first environmental protection laws, then you have the Rio summit, MDGs, SDGs, all of that falls into the, 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 the second trajectory, which is the second wave. And then comes the first the digital economy and then the internet economy, and which we today call the digital transformation. That is basically a transformation of business and industry. So it's a rebuilding of the marketized, marketized society, which was built on, on fossil fuel and, um, uh, uh, and, and industrialization, basically. And today, 
the uh, the factors of production is i mean land and uh, land and technology and capital remains labor is kind of going down but data is probably the biggest uh, uh, source of uh, production uh, or factor of production so so when we talk about iot when we talk about smart cities when we talk about the digital revolution when you talk about platform city platform urbanism all of that falls into that huge bubble of of digital transformation now, also, and when we talk about government, I, I don't know if you know the term GAAP, government as a platform, that's something which has uh, jumped on the wagon of digital transformation. So we're actually uh, technologizing or digitalizing government, which is a big part of the digital transformation. And now something very interesting happens. It's, um, and some economists call this now the third wave. I mean, Karl Polanyi doesn't live anymore, but there's uh, the concept of humanizing the economy and there are, there are several different concepts. But in, in, in essentially, it is again a response to what is going wrong in the digital transformation. And here we see all the concepts around open data, open government, data collectives, cooperatives, blockchain, like, Blockchains, you know, that's that's again, the whole thing is very fluid, of course, the technology that this sector uses is produced in the uh, uh, in the big tech sphere, which is uh, uh, which is always there. So uh, digital urban uh, uh, commoning peer to peer and also. Uh, the digital New Deal, but I mean, uh, one week ago, we, I was at the conference of Ars Electronica, the main title, uh, the umbrella title there was the Digital New Deal, uh, which somehow corresponds to the Green New Deal, which the EU has signed recently. Uh, so these are all responses to this major, major trans transformation that's happening on, on the main mainstream level. And this is where we, we have to ask the question, why do we need transformative approaches in governance? Now, if we look at the city, which has been around for, for uh, let's say 12,000 years, uh, well, I mean, 9,000 years, uh, it has, I mean, it's, the city is probably the most, most fascinating artifact of human civilization. Uh, people have, people come together, connect with each other, uh, 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 do economic activities and do all kinds of things. And obviously there is a huge intrinsic need in human civiliz civilization to come together and do things collectively. And the proximity of people is extremely important. So for 12,000 years, it worked perfectly. However, very recently that thing started to tip. So cities covered just about two to 3% of, of the total land of, of the planet. However, they produce 70, I mean, they produce 70% of the economy. They uh, consume 60% of the global energy. They produce 70% of greenhouse gases, 70% of global waste. So we have a huge problem, a planetary problem that these cities are creating. So uh, the, the problem is clear. Uh, and now we see that the old regime of governance and bureaucracy, oh, by the way, that we have to, we have to mention that on the side because after the industrial revolution and the great transformation, this massive block of bureaucracy was built up, which actually supported uh, the, uh, the transformations of the last 100 or 150 years. And, uh, and, that's, and that bureaucracy was also responsible for the, for the problems that, um, that industrialization has created. So the old regime of governance and bureaucracy is now made responsible for creating unsustainable practices and for being unresponsive to current planetary challenges. This is why we need a new uh, bureaucracy and new governance models. And um, so if I put my timeline on, uh, on, on the side and uh, take the two poles or two trajectories of, of evolution or uh, yeah, evolution, I would say, which is a digital transition transformation, which is completely market centered at, with the underlying logic of profit. And then you have these, uh, uh, this, it's growing movements around the world, which we now call transformative action, which is more civic centered, which is uh, uh, which has the logic of more adaptiveness and responsiveness. So the key question for governance now is how to open up old bureaucracies and tap into the intelligence of new grassroots initiatives. This is the main challenge, and this is the, the same challenge for for smart cities.
And uh, I was involved with a project about self-driving cars and the future of cities. And what we uh, what we found out was that uh, we have three uh, big trends. One is a sharp rise in academic research on transition and transformation, even though they are conceptually still pretty ill-defined. Uh, so transition and transformation. Second is the growth of social movements, which uh, a goes with new values, new lifestyles. Uh, Eco-sufficiency is, is a term which is very much used in Germany, for example. And then we have a third movement called uh, new localism. There's a wonderful uh, book written by uh, Bruce Katz on this and with international examples. So we really see something, something happening there on the local level, on the municipal level. So there is a shift of power from, from the national level or, uh, yeah, or transnational level to uh, to local levels. And there were lots of talks at this conference which spoke about this. And I, if, I felt like, I mean, this is the central issue um, of, of, our, of the future of governments. And um, so what is transformative governance in the context of the smart city? We'll talk about that in the workshop, but um, let me just frame this uh, in, a, in a simple way. So the smart city is, I mean, oh my God, uh, yeah, smart city. I've been dealing with this for years now. And I think one of the biggest misunderstandings is that the smart city is a clever city. Cleverness has absolutely nothing to do with the, with, with the, with the concept which was born with, with completely different ideas. So smartness in the smart city is the deployment of ICT, information and communication technologies on a mass scale. This is it. That's, there's not, nothing more or less to the smart city. And the, the, the academic or the technological concept behind is data-driven urbanism. This is the new urbanism. And we are, in, in urban theory, we are entirely uh, opening up a new field and completely new concepts about what is a city. The imaginary of the city is, is, is transforming radically at the moment. And the ideology, I would call it an ideology of this movement, is uh, is the notion that the magic key to building and managing sustainable and efficient cities of the future lies in data-driven urbanism. However, we have known that this, but the, the, the smart cities and the platformization of cities is still not really responding to the planetary challenges like, like climate change or the local challenges, which is more social, sometimes actually very often very psychological. So all of this is not really responding to that. So again, the question that comes up in governance is how to bend it towards a more participatory and cooperative direction. So that's the governance part. And what kind of new forms of technologies and new understanding of bureaucracy do we need for that? So um, this was my, my framing of today's discussion. I would uh, give on to Alois, who would dig deeper into the technology part uh, and democracy. Now, Ian gave a very beautiful introduction. Thank you so much for that. And he was speaking a lot about, so once you have the marketization of society, um, we can also call it um, to a certain degree, yeah, you have capitalism or, or similar terms to, to name this. And he was speaking a lot of responses to needs that occurred, to problems, to challenges. Now, I like to think about market expansion, not as the satisfaction of needs, but rather the seizing of opportunities which emerge. emerge. And especially when it comes to the transition of societies from, for example, from the industrial society um, to, to a service society or from an agrarian society to an industrial society, you have a lot of, not only a lot of problems, sure, you have a lot of problems. And Ian beautifully said that, um, you know, Western metropolis, take Munich, take Vienna, take uh, Berlin, whatever you take, um, their living conditions generations ago were horrible. You know, you didn't have running water, you didn't have sanitation, you had uh, people uh, renting, not uh, rooms, uh, as today young people do room shares, but people were renting shifts in beds. You had like a bed being rented out to three people. And of course, all these horrible um, societal situations, all of those horrible hygienic situations, first of all, they mean one thing, yes, there's a lot of suffering, but there's a lot of, of opportunities for new inventions, for new things to come up, for a public sphere to grow out of this 
suffering of the population of Troy. And this is basically how we slowly got to the point where we are now, to the social state, to the modern parliamentary system, to democracy as we know it today with all the implications which we are used to. And now we are coming to a couple of, yeah, I will, I will try to a little bit provoke. First of all, yes, we are standing at a point right now where things are being great and they are historically justified. When democracy grew up, all those institutions which we have today, parliament, elections, um, public government, um, all those institutions which are today governing the public sphere, the society, they were something radically new back in their days. We are speaking generations ago, we are speaking centuries ago, they came as something radically new. They seized the opportunity to grow into an area where there was a lot of problems, where there was a lot of suffering, and they did good. They did good for society, they did good for the evolution of the civilization as we know it today. But we come to the next point. Those institutions were created at the time which was setting a very, very different technological context as we have it today. Communication was uh, something very, very different. If you look, for example, at the Central European Parliament or take the British Parliament, in the day when those institutions were um, developed, you had a you had a struggle because be, between the old feudal structures and the emerging capitalist um, structures, which were fighting for a balance in society. So it was not anymore the feudal landlord who was saying, okay, this is how things are, but it was all of a sudden the industrial uh, capitalist with way more political, no, not political, but way more economic power, who then also demanded some political power to have a say in how society evolves. And back in those days, communication was obviously something different from what we know it today. I'm now speaking from Budapest. Each of you is sitting in, in your own part of the world and we're still able to interact. We are still able to exchange ideas. We are able even to do things that uh, to express our political um, position on something. Like we can do televoting, things like this. But back in, back in the days of the early days of the parliament, the parliament met every couple of months, maybe even every couple of years, and delegates from all over the, the, the realm came on long distance. They were traveling for days. They were traveling long distances to be able to meet and to deliberate on a certain topic. Now, this was a extremely modern institution back then. Today, it is an institution which, well, is a legacy institution and is something which we are having for mainly the reason that, well, it always has been here around since we, since our generation remembers this. So this is a challenge today, which we have when it comes to public governance, when it comes to democracy. Democracy is about two things. First of all, enabling all stakeholders to have a say in the political game, however you want to call it. And it's about creating opportunities. It's creating spaces of freedom in which then markets can grow, in which activities can grow. So one thing is the democratic system, which is legacy, which is inherited from our ancestors. And the other legacy system, which we are dealing with is public administration. So the modern public administration is based on principles, which in the past used to be ultra modern again, and very efficient. You have Weber's um, yeah, not, not necessarily his notion, but his summary of, of the ideal um, bureaucratic apparatus, so to speak. And uh, there was plenty of thoughts being put in how public officials can be normed in such a way, inspired by the Prussian army, where you had normed individuals, which could be easily replaced. If you shoot one soldier, you can replace it immediately with another one. And the same similar idea was then also in the public administration, where it was all about having individuals which can be replaced. You know, all of them are doing their specific tasks. And if they're not good at them, well, you take them out, put a new one in and so on and so forth. And by this, you have created an amazing machinery. In the past, it was modern. Today, it is legacy. Today, we can instruct technical machines to 
do certain procedures of governance. So you can think of situations where you do algorithmic governance and you do plenty of this. We can use partly even artificial intelligence to bring in to, to, to streamline certain processes, which in the past were purely bureaucratic. And the same thing on the democratic side, where in the past it was necessary that you had delegates which traveled to a point in, in to a geographic point, to a place. Today you can rethink these processes by means of technology. Now, just to give you an example of what can be done today, maybe you have, you have heard of the concept of liquid democracy. Now, I will just briefly introduce it to you. Um, there's plenty of literature on this. Liquid democracy is the idea that instead of delegating uh, one's political power in a community to a delegate who then decides based on their received political trust. In liquid democracy, you can create, by means of information technology, you can create a network of people which are connected and where their political power is being delegated. So very simple example, if I don't want to go to elections, I don't need to go to elections, if I, let's say, trust my neighbor, my, my spouse, my, my friend, my relative, that they will, that they are sound people and I just want to give them all my political power, liquid democracy gives me this possibility that I delegate my power, which I have, my political power in a society that I delegate it to them. Now, in Germany, and there has been a couple of cases around the world where political parties like the German pirates tried to do liquid democracy on, let's say, on an experimental scale. None of those experiments went very far. Most of them failed after an initial phase. So one way you can do liquid democracy is that you can do it wrong. Now, the thing, why, why do I say that you can do it wrong is because if you focus on liquid democracy on things like what opinions people have on some political issues, then you don't give the people the possibility to actually have a say in political issues. You just ask them, what's your opinion about it? And this is what happened, for example, with the German Pirate Party. They asked their members, what's your view on a certain political matter? And the members of their party, those who engaged in this process, they could have a say in how the party policy will be shaped. A much more interesting thing is if you apply liquid democracy to things which are tangible to people, like one thing that is tangible is, for example, the funding of public projects, the funding of community projects around you, or the passing of laws, the uh, appointment of public officials. Liquid democracy can be applied to many domains. So the slide which I'm showing you is illustrating public funding by means of liquid democracy. So in this case, if you, yeah, we have here a community of six people, A to F, and A has delegated their say on when, where, where their tax money is going to, A has delegated to B, B and C have delegated to D, D has delegated to E, and um, F has not delegated to anyone. Now, in this particular case, E is proposing to fund some project. For example, I don't know, this project can be let's wage a war on some country most people never heard of, or let's, I don't know, build a kindergarten or let's um, whatever, you know, you can have a project is then uh, up, to, up to discussion what, what you mean by that. But there is an actor proposing the funding of a project. And in this case, E is asking for 350 units from her network. Now, what if A says, okay, I don't want to support this particular idea. I don't want to give my money to wage a war um, somewhere around. Then the support crumbles out of the whole network for E and all of a sudden E has much less political power available in a particular decision. Now this concept is called the quantum budget. The idea is that you take public funding, that you take taxation down to the level of um, 
yeah, applying liquid democracy to it. So this is something which can be taught off by means of the technology which is readily available today. And here's the difference. While generations ago, people had to send money in terms of tangible units by post in, uh, when they had to travel for days to reach a destination, today we can delegate trust by means of electronic communication, by means of the digital signature. So in the last, let's say from the 60s, uh, from the 70s, 80s on, humanity has discovered technologies which enable some radical transformation in the domain of democratic governance, in the domain of public administration. Now, why is this important? Because it creates new opportunities for markets, again, to emerge. And this is what Ian was speaking earlier from the marketization of society with new technology, as happened with the introduction of the web, the introduction of mobile communications, the mobile phone, the smartphone as such, um, GPS, logistics, transit, you name it. All those radical transformations of domains we experienced in the past decades were due to the emergent new technology from the 70s and 80s and 90s mainly. One domain which hasn't yet been radically transformed is the domain of public governance, is the domain of democracy. And this is where we do have some potential to discover things. Where do we stand now? Today, we are speaking of so-called government technology. GovTech is a big sector, which is mainly about, well, creating information systems which are, which are making certain things faster. Like, I don't know, you can faster process tax returns. You can faster process um, that you count how many people you have in your, in your country, stuff like this. Now, while the focus is clearly on increasing efficiency and the whole e-governance sector is about coming up with technology to automate certain processes, it bears also extremely dangerous um, flaws. All this technology is completely outside of democratic control. And that's something extremely hazardous because all the GovTech which we have out there is being controlled by maybe not even government actors. Maybe it is sold by private companies and licensed to government where the data is then processed. But definitely we have the problem that there is no democratic process governing the architecture I'm not speaking high level architecture, I'm speaking about the code as such of the systems which are out there. So the challenge for us is to come up with systems which we can control in a democratic way. Currently, the thing is that we have a public administration, which is basically, you know, some an existing organism, which has been doing well for generations, but is now being challenged by technology. We have a democratic institutions, which again have been doing good for generations, but again are being faced with some new realities to which, 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 which cast a new light on them from which they can, certain things can be resolved. And the problem is that even if you have all those institutions, they are not able, they have not been designed to control technological systems, they haven't been designed to control the code. And whoever is controlling the code can is controlling basically the public governance today. So we need to find ways. No, we don't need to find ways. The ways have been already found. We need to apply ways how to control the government technology which is out there. Because if we cannot do this, and right now we are on a road to neo-feudalism, where again, like in the good old days, where the feudal lord was basically, you know, the the the, the prosecutor and judge in one um, in one role, we have today the same thing eh, that we have technology out there, and uh, which we are unable to control. So this is a very big problem. So how can we tackle this? We need technological skills. We need to have people in positions of democratic decision-making who have the technical knowledge 
the same applies to public administration. Both public administration and institutions of democracy need people with technological skills on board so that those people can go, can analyze the domain, and can rethink from inside how to again establish a balance between democratic decision making on one side and the new realities, which is the technology on the other side. So this is basically the setting which I'm which I'm putting into this discussion. I myself am a professor at the um, Hochschule Ludwigsburg, where we have a new program for educating future public officials, which is trying to go a little bit in this direction. So concretely, my concrete task over there is to teach programming skills, to teach software engineering skills to the next generations of public officials who will then, endowed with this knowledge, be able to look at their system, which they are planted in from inside and with all the domain knowledge and all with the technological knowledge they will have available, they will be able to maybe rethink certain mm -hmm. things. <clears throat> okay, let me start with Merelin or Merijin as the Spanish speakers say. Uh, this is a city north of Bogota. Bogota is the is the capital of Colombia. By the way, the mayor of Bogota spoke today at, at the conference. So Medellin was one of the most unequal and segregated cities of the world. And the, the, the violencia there was really unspeakable. I mean, it was just like little shootings. They have rockets and they have... Uh, 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 submarines, um, you know, so this is a completely dim different dimension of violencia that Medellin experienced for 40 years. And uh, then in 1933, Pablo Escobar was, uh, was killed. And at that time, it was the most dangerous city in the world. And in the next uh, years, the next 15 to 20 years, it went through a huge transformation. And, and 2013, Medellin got literally all the prizes that a city can get and it was called the most innovative city of the world by Wall Street Journal, Citibank, and so on. And the person, the, the, the key person behind this was Sergio Fajardo. He was a professor of mathematics when he came to power. He uh, had this slogan, only the best for the poor. And you have to imagine a city which is like, there's no city which is so fragmented like Medellin. And Sergio Fajardo, Fajardo uh, convinced the elite of the city that we have to tie together these fragments and create a completely new understanding of the city and get the poor and the marginalized into the urban process. And uh, this was 2004. And uh, the first thing that he did of connecting the the, the fragments of the city is building very weird public transport systems like this cable liner, the first public transport cable liner as a public transport system. And he called it social urbanism. And the second thing that he did was uh, education. Uh, so one third of the city's budget, I think no city in the world has invested one third of its budget in educational infrastructure. And they build these things called library parks in the marginalized areas. And these were not just, you know, uh, nice buildings. They said, these are going to be the most beautiful architecture of the continent of, of South America. So what happens in these spaces was, uh, was a thing, uh, was a method that they developed, which, which they called social map. So these were not just places where people would go and read books in a library, but they would actually completely read, they, map themselves, they'd understand who they are, and then they would start to reinvent themselves. And uh, I, was, I was here in one of these places myself, and it was, it's an amazing experience just to see the energy that's going on in these libraries. And when I talk about dancing in the smart city, I actually mean this. There's a lot of dancing going on here in these, uh, in these places of innovation. And there was a, an exhibition in 2015 in Berlin called Medellin topography of knowledge. And this is absolutely key to understand the transformation of Medellin. Uh, before, before they started doing these, these uh, educational buildings and those um, social infrastructures, they started with a, with, a, uh, with, a, with a project where they connected the, the hubs of the social mapping, they connected them into a learning landscape. So the knowledge that was created in those neighborhoods were fed into the knowledge network of the city. And um, 
And so the knowledge network of the city actually became the most transformative power of the place. So people started to learn from each other. And when I was there, the people from Nicaragua, Nicaragua, Guatemala, uh, 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 Peru, were, were all there learning from what Medellin is doing in these little uh, hubs. So these, what they created were little civic laboratories of learning and innovation. And the knowledge that was created was fed into the system. So this became the thing. And this is one of the... Uh, places in, in Medellin where they started even drawing their, their walls and the way they transformed their physical space was just phenomenal. So that's Medellin. Second is Calgary. Calgary is in Canada, completely different setting. It's a first world country, very rich. And they created a hundred year vision. A handful of cities which have a hundred year vision. Uh, Singapore has a 50 year vision. <laughs> Uh, so what they did was in 2000, uh, between 2005 and six, uh, they did a large uh, community vis visioning process in which they involved 18,000 people over 18 months. Supposed to be the largest community vision process of the world. And um, so it looked something like this. It's still on the net. You can go, on, um, go and look on the website. Uh, what they did was they created um, uh, five uh, urban systems, like built environment, e economy, governance, national environment, social. And to all these five spheres, they had 114 aims. So this was created in the visioning process. And then, and then the innovation actually began. Now it's all out there on a website and citizens are invited. So the floor is open and the citizens are invited now to bring in ideas how to reach those aims. And there's a timeline, it's beautifully done. Also the aesthetic is very important. Also uh, Medellin, but the, the aesthetic is enormous. You don't get people to doing things if, they're, if things are ugly. They have to be cool, they have to be beautiful. And so, so now the citizens are uh, solving the local problems of Colgo. Uh, but, but also with academia, there's a lot of science going on. So it's not just citizens who are, you know, so it's, it, there are a lot of networks of, of different stakeholders. So what happened in, Med, uh, in Calgary was, a very nice diagram here on the left, you see just those dots, those are the actors before. And then you have this arrow, which is showing like the, I mean, I mean, Britain, they would call it nudging, but I wouldn't call this nudging. This was really getting people together and giving a focus to the direction and then connecting the actors with each other. And this is something that I've been observing in many, many cities. This can be generalized as a, as a formula because Karina said, what can we copy? This is something I can easily copy. I can, you know, I can tell you about dozens of cities who have done this with, with great success. And, and finally, Taiwan. This is a project I'm working on very intensely. Uh, it's uh, the, and I, might, I call my project, the Digital Agoras of Taiwan. Uh, they're working on a large scale technology-based experiment with democracy. Uh, civic engagement and, and social innovation. And Taiwan by now has the largest civic tech ecosystem of the world. And as Audrey Chang says, democracy itself is a technology. Uh, this will be interesting, like, you know, how, what Alo is, you know, it'd be really interesting to talk about, about these new uh, technologies and democracy. So the principles, the political principles is radical transparency, civic participation, and a rough consensus. This is something they have taken from the uh, digital tech community of the 50s. And Audrey Tang was you know, a tech geek from, from, from the digital world. So that's also interesting how their narratives are, are, are intermingling, how political narratives are getting connected with, with technology, digital technological narratives. Uh, their social and economic aims are clear, increasing capacity for social innovation, problem solving capacity and crowdsourcing intelligence. And then uh, the methods and tools are orchestrating civic platforms and creating collaborative environments. And so the interesting thing is what the, the platforms that they have, they, we have them all over the world, but what they have done is they have interlinked them into an, into an ecosystem. And that's how they're leveraging the, uh, the energy of citizens in a completely different way. So you have uh, social dialogue platforms, you have data collectives, you have fact-checking platforms. That's very, very interesting, how they're dealing with misinformation and disinformation uh, 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 with civil society. Uh, uh, this is just, you know, just, you know, trying to tie together all those platforms, just trying to understand how this ecosystem looks like in, in Taiwan. Uh, this is GovZero. This was the first uh, uh, platform that they created. 
Uh, but I think I won't go into these details now because it's, uh, yeah. Okay, V Taiwan, this is like the, a key platform. And what I found interesting is again, the narrative, where do we go as a society? This is on one of the most tech savvy uh, uh, community in the world uh, is using a, a term which has nothing to do with technology. And, and this is Polis again, this is an American platform, uh, which was, uh, it's an open source tool and they completely changed it and adapted to, to, the, to the needs of Taiwan. And they use this as a canvas of understanding the opinions of the people. So this is not communicating, it's just on where are we? And very often in a, in a, in a polarized world, uh, after they do their hearings, it comes out that we are actually not so far apart as we thought. You know, that's a very, very interesting thing. It would be interesting to look into. To sum it up, I think I'll use that, that diagram of, of Calgary. Actors are alone, bring them together, bring, build networks of trust, and, and you have something happening there. And the, the role of the state is how do we orchestrate that? So, or, and also, and, and, uh, to, to the orchestration of the people in, intermingling with each other. It's also about the knowledge. This is extremely important. The knowledge that is produced, how is it distributed? How are we learning from each other? And how is it changing behaviors? Because that's what learning is about. It's not just uh, absorbing in knowledge, but how are we transforming ourselves? And I'd like to finish with one slide, which is, I'll go back 2,500 years uh, to Athens. I, I love that city. And the story, the success story of Athens is how they galvanize the intelligence of its citizens. And whenever I, I look up digital democracy, we some, it, it literature somehow ends up with Athenian democracy. I find this remarkable. And this is a challenge which has, uh, you know, in the 21st century remained the same. How do we galvanize the intelligence of of, of our citizens. Thank you.